Thank you. God is so good all the time. I want to turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. Thank you, Lord. Verses 1 through 4. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. It said, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Uh, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Powerful, powerful revelation that Isaiah had received in seeing the very throne of God. But I love what he said. He said, the glory of God fills the whole earth. And if God's glory fills the whole earth, why is it that we don't experience the fullness of his glory. I'm going to tell you, his glory is in this house today. What keeps us from seeing, or what keeps us from experiencing the very glory of God? And I will tell you, the Bible said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. In other words, they live on meager rations when what is before them is the greatness of God himself in their presence. And so we say to ourselves, Lord, where am I in you? How can I experience you the way that Isaiah experienced you? I love what Peter says in Acts. He said, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Isn't that wonderful? And what Peter realized in that is that when you... When he looked at the Gentiles, because the Jews thought Gentiles were dogs. Remember the Samaritan woman? She came and she said, uh, and she was seeking of the Lord. And, the, and Jesus said to her, is it good for me to give the meat that is, that is for the, the children unto a dog? Now, if Jesus called you a dog, how would you feel? I bet a lot of people walk out of here mad. I ain't going back to that church. But you know what she said? She said, but master, even the dogs eat the crumbs under the table. And he said when he looked at her, he said, no greater faith have I found in all of Israel than I find in this woman. You know why? She humbled herself. A lot of people carry pride, and pride will keep you from God because God hates pride. That's how the devil fell. He said, I'm as beautiful as God. I'm important. Ananias and Sapphira, they thought they were important and they were going to outgive uh, what Barnabas gave so that they could keep the preeminence in the church. But it cost them their lives. And the thing we need to understand is this woman. Now, was Jesus actually calling her a dog? No, he was more or less saying, you come to a Jew. And you ask for something, knowing what the Jews think of you, why do you do that? He says, don't you know it's not good to give the meat that is for the children unto a dog? She could have walked out of there and said, what a, call me a dog? I'm out of here. I've seen people leave the church because they get, they get, th their pride gets wounded. A message comes that, 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 that it angers them. How many know that the gospel of Jesus Christ, it pierces? It ought to make me mad. It, it ought to 
to uh, uh, have an effect in my life. It ought to disrupt my thinking. It ought to cause me to, 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 to think about the word that went forward. And I know this one thing. Those are good things. And I'll tell you, when the word of God goes, the Bible said the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. And it pierces asunder. It can divide the, the marrow even from the bone. I mean, it is, it is, it is a, a tool of precision, and God uses it, and that's what he said his word is. It afflicts me. It hurts, and that's what she was willing to endure. Why? Because she was desperate. How many of us are desperate today? You know, if we, if we come into the house full, we won't receive. But if we come in desperate, God, I'm desperate for your presence. I'm desperate, Lord God, for answers in my life. And I'll tell you, no matter how many years you serve the Lord, you should be desperate. He said the glory of God fills the whole earth. And then we have to examine ourselves and say, where am I in that? What do I see? You know, because the sight that we need is not the natural sight, but it is the spiritual sight. And spiritual sight only comes from believing. The Bible said without faith, it is impossible to please God. And I'll tell you what hinders me from seeing the fullness of God. What hinders me from seeing the glory of God? What hinders me from knowing the attributes of the character of God? What hinders me? He said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. They live on meager rations when I've given them so many wonderful things. In the Strong's Concordance, you will find in the Hebrew word is kabod. Kabod, meaning weight as a significance, splendor, or concupiscent. <laughs> Cocu, I, I was practicing that this morning. It's not a word I've thrown around very often. It's copusiness. I did it. Cocu, I ah, forget it. Anyway, it's a big word. Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll get there. <laughs> Uh, my tongue is tied there. I said, boy, that's a hard one. Well, I want you to know that the glory of God is a weight or a significance of God. The weight or the significance of God. Oh, that there would be a weight and a significance of God in this house. That we would have a, a, the weight of his glory. In Genesis 28 and 16, it said, Then Jacob awoke from his sleep. He thought, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. And that's something. He said, he woke from his sleep and said, Surely the, the Lord, his presence is in this house. And I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. I want you to know, you're right at the gate of heaven. You're right at the house of God. You're right in the presence of God. And you say, Lord, open my eyes as you did with Jacob, because Jacob did not perceive the presence, but God allowed him to see what was always there. I'm going to tell you what, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at once. I love what David said. He said, though I made my bed in hell, there he was. God is, is everywhere. And I'm sure when, when he talked about hell, he wasn't talking about Guyana or, 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 or that hell, but he's talking about the hell he made out of his own life. How many can witness to that? David had made some messes. I mean, he had one son that killed one son because that son had raped his daughter, his, his, um, his, his sister, and, and all of the chaos that went on in David's house. Well, when you have 300 kids or so, you know, you may have a few problems. <laughs> and, 
and then of course he had to be, he had to banish Absalom because Absalom had killed uh, his other son, and and then Absalom he got a grudge against his father and 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 was angry with his father, and then the enemies of David found their uh, took the son and manipulated him and to divide in the kingdom, and, and and I think that was a hell. He said, though I made my bed in hell, yet he was with me. He was there. We sing that song. He was there all the time. He was there. How many know he's there all the time? How many know that he doesn't leave nor forsake you, but he loves you? But what I love about what Jacob experienced, he said, and the fear of the Lord fell upon him. The fear of the Lord fell upon him. You know, Jesus talks about the highway of holiness. He said, the Bible said he came to make the crooked path straight. And, 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 and there's a highway of holiness, and that's a way that the saints walk. But on any highway, and any highway, you'll sign on each side there's a ditch. Because it's going to be drainage, or else everything's going to sit in the road. But what you realize is on that highway of holiness, there's one ditch called legalism, and there's another ditch called lawlessness. So we, we come into a place of legalism. Legalism means that I can make my own way to heaven through certain things. I mean, that's what the Tower of Babel was, is legalism. We will build a tower into the heavens. We will uh, do this. I'm saved because I dress right. I'm saved because I do this or because I do that. And what happens is that the love of God comes and it lifts us out of the ditch of legalism. But then many people will go all the way over to the place of lawlessness. And lawlessness means that, you know, I can do anything I want and go to heaven. I, I don't have to abide by, the, by, by the, the attributes or the laws of God. I am free. I can do whatever I want. And guess what? Because I said hocus pocus or because I said Jesus came in my heart, I'm free. And that means all my, all my future sins are forgiven. I want you to know something. That is the ditch of lawlessness. But you know what? If love lifts us out of the ditch of legalism, what lifts us out of the ditch of lawlessness? It is the fear of God. Amen. David said, he prayed and he said, he said, Lord, he said, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Don't leave me. I want you to know the fear of God is not the fear of his presence. It's the fear of his absence. It's the fear of his absence. Anybody who fears the presence of God has got something to hide like Adam and Eve when they hid behind the bush. Then what do we do when we have that kind of fear? We confess it to the Lord and ask him to forgive us when we receive his forgiveness. But the fear of God is the fear of his absence. Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. God, I desperately need you and want you. And every action in my life needs to be weighed that I do not sin against you. I love what Paul said. He said, he said should we sin that grace may abound? He said, God forbid. Because sin has its penalties. We talked about the prodigal son. He came back to his father. His father restored him wholly, but the scars, the scars that he brought in his mind, he had to live with them. And so we always have to understand the devil loves to come and say, well, if you sin, God is able and just to forgive you. He'll quote scriptures out of context to try to tell you you have more liberty than you had. Any of us military boys, and there's a few of us here, we know what liberty is. And how many people do you know that went out in liberty and found themselves in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in jail? 
And I'll tell you, there's nothing a captain hates to hear at 2 in the morning is that he's got to get out of his bed and come down and bail you out. You don't make him happy when you do that. And that's why the Bible says don't use your liberty to an occasion of sin. In other words, Lord, how can... You see, God gives us liberty. But how do we use it or do we abuse it? And, and so we need to realize, I remember in liberty, uh, we were given liberty after, after a basic training. I got paid my 300 and some dollars. Man, I felt rich. And I was there playing a pinball machine in the rec hall. And I looked around and said, what's my ID doing on the ground? And then what's this paper doing on the ground? Not reach? It's gone. Every single dime I had. I wasn't on liberty for 15 minutes and I was pickpocketed and all my money was taken. <laughs> you learn to put rubber bands around you. Whatever you got to do to secure that. But you see, in liberty, there's also things you need to be careful of. Because the devil is like a roaring lion ready to pickpocket you. And I remember one, uh, two guys were playing pool. And one evidently thought the other cheated because they had money on the table. And he took that cue stick and he wrapped him on the head and blood spurred out of his head all over the ceiling. And I remember that when the MPs were chasing him, he, there was a, a building that had, it was on post, but there was no, um, it was, uh, some of those buildings, you know, they were on post, but they didn't have foundation. And you could crawl under them. And they're under there looking for him. I, they finally got him. But you see, he had liberty after three months of basic training. But he found himself in bondage. We had another man. He was from Puerto Rico, but I, he, he, he knew how to use a blade. I'm just telling you, people can get into some real messes in liberty. But God gives us liberty because he loves us. He doesn't bind us or confine us. He wants us to freely worship him. But what we realize in this is the ditch of lawlessness. Our country during prohibition was, was, was making laws to keep people moral. Well, law, laws don't keep people moral. It's the love of God that can do it. It can lift you out of that. But where have we come since prohibition? We've come to lawlessness. They say over here that one square mile in Lewiston is the most dangerous square mile in all of New England. I was at the restaurant the other day and we saw uh, Jesse uh, Jackson's, uh, was it Jesse, what's his name? Uh, Albert Jackson, not Jesse. Albert Jackson, we saw his son and I was talking with him. I've known him since he was a little boy. And he looked at me and said, I want you to know something, Pastor. My daughter was just murdered over there in Lewis, in that square mile, by a man. I said, did they find the guy? He said, oh, yeah. He said, he's locked up for a long time, but I lost my daughter. I mean, you know what that is? It's called lawlessness. Lawlessness. And what we need to do is realize it's not legal. You know, every time that the uh, Congress convenes, they, they write more and more. You know how many millions of laws are on the book already? What we're finding out is, is legalism does not correct society. It's only God that can do that. It's only God that can do that. Our country needs God more than it's ever needed God. One of the, uh, uh, the writers of the Constitution said, the Constitution is only good as long as the people are moral. But when the people... Uh, uh, Go from morality to lawlessness, the Constitution will no more work. And that's that. Constitution is one of the best papers I think any country has ever experienced. It gives us liberty. It gives us freedom. But with that liberty and with that freedom comes a responsibility. And I believe that that responsibility will, will be understood through the fear of God. We need revival in this country. We're beginning to see some revival. We talked about that a little last week. 
uh, about um, is it uh, Mario Murillo, and 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 he took the, the the tent over there in California, and they told all oh, people don't go to tents anymore. This doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. He said it's dangerous at night where you are. Nobody's going to come out. And he said he put that huge tent up there, and it was filled with capacity, and people were even standing outside. And one of the notorious Notorious uh, drug dealers and gang members. He was the the head of the uh, one of the vilest gangs. Came forward and gave his heart to Jesus Christ. And he gave the pastor a bag of uh, marijuana. And he said, "This I was going to sell." He said, "I want you to know something. I." have received this message. You see, that's the power of God. That's the glory of God. That's what will bring people to salvation. And if in the, one of the darkest states in this country, it can, it can begin to happen. It can happen in Maine. It can happen anywhere. But Lord, we need your glory yeah. this morning. <clears throat> we need your presence this yeah. morning. We need, your, we need you, Lord God, this morning. So Jacob awoke from his sleep and thought, surely the Lord is in this place. And he said, no, I was not even aware of it. <laughs> oh, so many Christians, they live without being aware of the goodness and the greatness of God. He said to, the, he said to Ezekiel when he took him up on the mountain, he said, what do you see? I think that's what the Lord's saying to us today. What do you see? Well, I see a bunch of liberal Democrats, and, and I, I see this and that and the other. You know what? What do I see? I see the power and the glory of God and his ability. I see that God can do what man cannot do. Amen? Amen. It is not in a man, it's in Jesus. Yes, thank you, Lord. Amen. Now, I voted this last time, and I'll always vote for people who are closest to my convictions, but I want you to know that my vote is not what's going to liberate this country. It is Jesus. It is Jesus. It is Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Thank you, Lord. The splendor of God. This is the brightness, the brilliance, the dazzle, the display, the luster, the magnificence, the majesty. There's so many other words. To talk about the presence of God. Oh, we need his presence today. We need his presence today. And he's here because the Bible said the glory of God fills the whole earth. Yes. God, that my eyes will not be eclipsed to your glory. Father, and you know, when you begin to pray that God may begin to show you things that he wants you to set aside. The Bible said to, to repent of your sins and to set aside every weight that does so easily beset you. And many people there think, well, I like that. But we have to be willing to give up whatever we hear the Lord to say, set that aside. Set that aside. And, 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 and we have to be willing to do that. Lord, I don't understand it. And many people go back to them. Well, I don't understand that. You know what? What's it matter? There's a lot of things you'll never understand. I was preaching last night to 40 men at a homeless shelter. It was a wonderful time last night with these men. And one man stood up and he says, and he made a statement that I don't believe in God. I don't believe in him. But I want you to know something. He's real whether someone believes or not. He's real. He's real. Amen. He's real. In 1 Kings 8, 10 through 11, it says, When the priests withdrew from the holy place, a cloud filled the temple of the Lord, and the priests could not perform their services because the cloud the, for the glory of the Lord had filled that house. Wouldn't you love to come to some meetings where you couldn't even get up and preach? When you, you have an agenda... But you can't fulfill the agenda because the glory of God is so great in the house. Yes. Huh. I've been to some of them old Pentecostal meetings. We need a lot more of them. 
And we know that when you get into the glory of God, how people react, you know, somebody. I know I was just say about my grandmother when she caught a little fish that big, she'd scream for a while. My grandfather would catch a fish that long and never say a word. Every personality is going to be different. Everybody's going to react differently. But people will probably share their emotion when they come into the very presence of God. It can bring excitement into the house. It can bring excitement in your life. And people may react in, 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 in various uh, forms, but I want you to know something. We just need to say, Lord, we need your glory. I think of the glory of God. To be alive with ample, bounteous, bountiful, crawling with extensive, exuberant, full of, gl of glory, generous, heavy, lavish, liberal, lush, all kinds of words. I don't have to say any more. You get the message, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> But what we realize is that the glory of God is a very powerful thing. In Exodus 16, 7, it says, So Moses and Aaron said unto the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumblings. How many have been grumbling Christians? He said that he's heard your grumblings against him. His glory is accompanied with all of his attributes, including judgment. Every part of God, God is one. God is love, but he's also just. He's also holy. All of his attributes are within him. And not one is separated from another. Some people get into, well, what is God? Ask a question, what is God? Oh, I believe God is love. He's a whole lot more than that. The love is wonderful. Well, I believe God is grace. He's, he, he's a whole lot more than that. And I love what Paul said. He said, I know whom I have believed. Do we know him today? Do we know him? In the beginning was the word. The word was with, was with God and the word was God. I've had people say to me, well, I know God, but I don't know the word the way you do. You can't know God and not know the word. Right. Because God is the word. Right. That makes sense? Yes. And, and I want you to understand this. If we really believe the word of God, the Bible said that Jesus said, unless the tester die, the, the will is not enacted. But Jesus said, I died. That the will. Don't you know what New Testament, Old Testament mean? What's a testament? It's a will. And Jesus said, I have died to enact the testament. That all of its benefits become yours because you are my heirs. Thank you, Lord. Yes, amen. Isn't that wonderful? And I promise you, if you had a rich uncle who died and you were his favorite, you'd be at the, you'd be at the will reading, wouldn't you? But you'd be asking that lawyer everything that's there. What does that word mean? What does that mean? I'm, I'm curious about this. How do you know this or, or that? Or what are the boundaries? You'd want to know everything about that will. But yet Christians today allow dust to collect on their Bibles. And they wonder why they live in meager rations. When God said, I've given you an abundance. Yes. Thank you, Lord. When Jesus spoke against the devil... You know, I've had people, they, they hide their Bible under their pillow thinking it will keep them from the devil. The only way you can hide is in your heart. You, uh, uh, David said, thy word if I hid in my heart that I might not sin against him. That's where you got to keep it, not under your pillow. <laughs> and people have all kinds of things that they... That they, they think will keep them. I remember years ago, I was a little child, and I was in a, uh, at a body shop, and I was looking at, at a car that was, I mean, and the, uh, the guy that owned the body shop come out, and, and I said, wow, that's me. You see how those people died in that car. And I was intrigued. But on this dash of that 
car, I saw a statue. And I said to him, I said, what is that? Oh, he said, that's a saint that's supposed to keep him safe. He said, I don't think it worked. <laughs> because it's not in a statue. It's not in, in, in uh, taking this and putting it under your pillow. It's hiding it in your heart. I know whom I have believed. I am persuaded that he's able. How many serve an able God? How many serve a Cain God? <laughs> I just made that one up. But what we, we realize in that is that God is able to, to take care of every one of your needs. Thank you, Lord. Means alive. To be bounteous. To be to, to, the, the beauty of being in His presence. If the whole earth is filled with God's glory, then we, as God's people, ought to be noticing it at all times. We really, really, but why don't we? Because of a lack of knowledge, ignorance. How do we know God? You should know all of his attributes. We're going to start on Friday night going through, and, and it might take another week. We're going to order some more books uh, by A.W. Sozier about, about knowing the holy, knowing the holy. And I think we need to go through all of the attributes and in going through them, we begin to learn a little bit more about his completeness. Because I think so many people, they know one aspect of God, but they don't understand the fullness of God. One of the things that, uh, that Tozer wrote is about change. I've often said, I don't like change. But you know what Tozer said? Well... If there was no change, what hope would you have? <laughs> and well, you know, maybe I do like change. Because <laughs> I pray for it all the time. Lord, change my heart, oh Lord. Help me. So in that sense, change works for us. Not against us. Isn't that wonderful? Thank you, Lord. But we're going to realize this. Now, he came down out of their grumbling and he showed his glory in that sense. But the Lord replied, I have, I, I have forgiven them as you asked. Nonetheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of the men who saw my glory and the miraculous song, signs uh, I performed in Egypt and in the desert but uh, men who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them shall ever see the land of promise. You know, there's a lot of Christians that never see the land of promise. The land of promise is not heaven. Because you know that when they went into the land of promise, there were giants there. When you go to heaven, there's no giant. But to dwell within the land of promise is to dwell in the place that flows with milk and honey. I mean, God wants us to, to, to dwell in such a, a place. I love what David said. He said, I've never seen the righteous begging bread. Yeah. That somehow God comes through. It may seem late, but he always comes through because he loves you. He said, if, he, he said this, if the earthly father know how to give you good gifts, how much more will the heavenly father give you the Holy Ghost, those who would ask him? You see, we need to ask. Lord God, fill me with your Holy Ghost. I want the presence of God to dwell within me. I want to walk in his fullness and in his glory. In 1 Chronicles uh, 29, 11 through 13, he says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as the head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. Think about that. You are the ruler of all things. 
in his in your hands are now our our God. We give you thanks and praise your glorious name. You know, he already has it for you. He knows, he said, he said, God knows your need before you ever even ask. But we still, he still wants us to ask, though. You may want to give a child a cookie, but he took it without asking. That makes you a little upset. I would have given you that cookie, but why didn't you ask? Well, Jesus said, you have not because you ask not. Or because you ask out of your own lust that would have hurt you. 16-year-old kid praying for Maserati. God may say, mm, I think we better not go ahead and answer that prayer right now. <laughs> I think there's a lot of 60-year-olds who couldn't handle it. But what I'm saying, and I'm not sure about Maseratis anyway. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just using it as a metaphor. I don't think anybody needs one of those. Um, but anyhow, let's get on here. So we look. Yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty. How do we see God today? How do we see him? You see, there are those that believe. He said, uh, what hinders us from seeking the experiences of the glory of God and his holy presence? Is it our traditions or just going through the motions is Christianity just a title or a badge that we wear? What does it express? Something, or does it express something deeper, like a personal relationship with God? Isn't that wonderful? Is my Christianity just a badge? Is it just something I wear? Ah, I'm a Christian. Or is it a deep-rooted revelation of the very presence of God and that he said, out of your bellies will flow rivers of living water. Where from? From heaven? No, he said, out of your bellies will flow the rivers of living water. Jesus said to the woman of the well, he said, he said, if you drink of this well, you shall thirst again. But if you drink of the well that I shall dip for the water that I shall dip for you, he said, you shall never thirst. She said, but she said, Master, she said, you have nothing to dip with. Because she's thinking of the natural. But she he was talking to her about the, the glory of God, the presence of God, the Holy Spirit of the Lord. I will fill you. The Bible said John the Baptist came baptizing in water. But he said, there's one that comes after me that's going to baptize in the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, I must go. And when I leave, the Holy Spirit will come. In the book of Acts, we see the powerful demonstration of the very presence of God. The Bible said, the glory filled that upper room. And they began to speak with other tongues. They began to worship the Lord in, in, a, in extreme ways that is beyond the intellectual capacity of a human being. But we come to the Lord. The Bible said, my ways are not your ways, and your ways are not my ways. We walk through those doors in our natural thinking, and we want to filter everything through our thinking. You cheat yourself when you do that. But when you saw he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He said, the renewing of the mind. In other words, my natural mind cannot conceive, it cannot understand the powers of God. But if I will surrender my mind to the Lord and let a renovation be done in my mind. See, you've got to be re rewired and reprogrammed in order to understand God in his fullness. And that's what God wants to do with each and every one of us. He said, you give me your mind and I'll give you the mind of, of, of my father. The Holy Spirit comes in. And the Bible said, you need not that any man teach you, for the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. Isn't that wonderful? Am I not reading out of the Bible when I say that? It doesn't mean it takes away from the office of a teacher. But what it is saying is that he's there. He's your comforter. He's your guide. He'll steer you from danger. 
He'll keep you from the wiles of the enemy. The Bible said that Satan is wiser than Daniel. Daniel was very wise. But he said he's still no match for the devil. It doesn't give the devil any glory. Because the Bible said, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. In Jude, the angel said, we dare not, you know, to speak out against, uh, against him. But we say, the Lord rebuke you. Even the angels realized that, that, that Satan was a cherub in heaven and had great power and still has great power. And the Bible says we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principality and powers. Don't forget the devil has power. But greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And that is Jesus. And he's overcome the world. Yes. <coughs> He has subdued the powers of this world. I'm going to tell you right now. The Bible said that Satan is the God of this world. He said that we're not of this world. He said that you are sojourners in a foreign land. That's, is that the Bible? He said you are, you dwell in a foreign place. But the Lord's going to come. And the Bible said he'll put his foot upon. You know what? He's the landlord. But he's allowed this rogue a tenant. I had a tenant one time and he put a restraining order against him so I couldn't go collect my, ta my, my money. <laughs> yeah, I went to collect my money and I said, I need, I need my rent. And, and he called the cops and said, I threatened him. <laughs> And the cop said, well, now you've got a restraining order against you. You can't go collect your rent anymore. It's kind of like the devil, you know. I think he probably learned that from the devil. Let me tell you how I got the world. <laughs> he may occupy in this world. He may be the God of this world, but there is a God coming. How many know? And he's going to put his foot upon the Mount of Olives. And that mountain is going to split in two. And he's going to take the power. And the Bible said he's going to take that tenant old Satan and he's going to throw him, chain him up fur and throw him into the lake of fire for, for a thousand years. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. Thank you, Lord. In Proverbs 30, 18 and 19, it said, there are three things that are too amazing for me for that I do not understand the way of the eagle. This is Solomon. I do not understand the way of the eagle in the sky, the way of the snake on a rock, the way of a ship on the high seas, and the ways of man with a maiden. I, he said, I do not understand those. He, there's a lot of things you're not going to understand. That man last night that didn't believe, he says, well, if God knows all things, why does he bother? That mean, why didn't you just do it and stop putting us through it? <laughs> if God knows all things, <laughs> then, then why didn't he just do it and not put us through it? <laughs> kind of, you know, hmm, got something there. <laughs> it's because he wants sons. He wants to raise us up. He said, I want you to raise you up to be like me. Now, I want you to know we'll always be human. We're not little gods and never will be. But he wants to raise us up to be like him. He said, Father, he said, the glory that you've given me, I've given to them that they might be one even as we are one. Again, we get back to the word glory. I'm going to Hurry up here a little bit. Hallelujah. Philippians 4 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever is true, whatsoever is noble, whatsoever is right, whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think on these things. Clear your mind of the filth and the mess of the world and start to think about Jesus. You know, Peter could walk on water when he looked at Jesus, but when he looked down at the obstacle beneath him, he began to sink. I want you that God is in complete and total control. 
The Bible said in Psalms chapter 2 that when the, when, when the unrighteous rage against him and his people, the Bible said he sits up there and he laughs. Go ahead and read it in your, in, in your Bible in, in, second, in Psalms chapter 2. And you'll find that what God does is laughs at them. Because they don't realize what little ants they are. They think they're in control, but they're not. God said, I'll never allow them to do more than I, I desire for them to, to do. And I will close this chapter up. And we're about to come to a new chapter. The Bible says six, six, thousand, uh, six days he worked. On the seventh day he rested. You know what we're in? We're in the seventh, beginning of the seventh millennium. We're in the beginning of the seventh millennium. You know what that is? The wrath. God's going to close this chapter very soon. We're seeing it. We're seeing it all over the world. We're seeing unrest like we've never seen before. We're seeing Israel now as a nation since 1948. What a miracle that is. There are so many uh, uh, scriptures uh, that are being fulfilled in the day that we live. It is just amazing what is happening in the world. Are we supposed to uh, cry and mourn and whine? The Bible said when you see these things come to pass, look up and rejoice. Because I'm coming. I'm coming for my people. I'm coming for those who will fear me. The Bible said the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Now I've got a lot more I wanted to share with you, but I, I really think maybe we ought to end it here. But I want you to know that God loves you. He's for you, man. He died for you. He come to make a way for you. And as I said last week, God to a man is what water is to a fish and what air is to a bird. Men that live outside of God are lost. They have no purpose. They have no direction. What a horrible life to walk blind in the spirit and then to find yourself fallen into a spirit that is not of God but, but evil. And I'm showing you a lot of people, and I'll share you this in my closing. And this is a little story. Some of you have heard it. But I was at McDonald's up on Conger Street. And a man walked in there, wild-eyed. The, the place was so full of people, there was nowhere to sit. And I was sitting at a table, and, and I saw two people sitting at a table that had six chairs. And so I said to them, I said, would you mind if I have a seat here? And they said, no, you may. And I began to talk to them. And they said, well, we're Catholic. Usually when people say they're Catholic, it means buzz off. <laughs> <laughs> they may have never been to Mass in 40 years, but, but I'm Catholic. I've got a title. And I began to talk to him about things of God, but it was getting nowhere. And all of a sudden, a man walked in there. His eyes were dilated. He's obviously on some sort of a drug, but he had walked into the spirit realm. You know, drugs can bring you into a spirit realm. But without Jesus, that's a horrific place to be. And he walked into that place, eyes wide dilated, and he, and he hollered out, and all the people heard him. He said, there's blood running down the street. There's blood running down the street. The war is intensive. And people began to snicker. You know? And I looked at him. And I said, you are right, sir. There's blood running down those streets. And it's flowing right into hell. And the devil is reaching a war for the souls of men. I said, but I want you to know there is a, there is a God, there is a Jesus that can save and make whole. I told you there were six chairs, only three of us there, and he sat down. And I began to pray with him. I began to pray with him, and I told him there, Jesus is the conqueror. He's overcome that battle. I had two Catholics as him in church at night. <laughs> 
because I think the, the cows were thinking, maybe there is something we haven't <laughs> explored yet. <laughs> but we live in a supernatural world. Yes, we do. We do. The supernatural in this world is more real than the natural. And this man stepped through drugs. He stepped into the supernatural but unprepared to do so. When we step into the supernatural, we are armed with the, with, with the armor of God. We have our breastplate of righteousness. We have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. We have the helmet of salvation. We have the whole sword of the spirit. Amen. So when we go into the, into the spirit realm, we go with joy. Boy, that spirit was heavy in church last night. Woohoo! We had a blast. But for the sinner, through a drug, whatever portal, step into the spirit, it's a horrific, horrific experience. And I believe there are many over at St. Mary's that are up there because they have stepped into the spirit and have been looked at as lunatics because their minds uh, uh, fail them when the answer to every single one of them is Jesus. Yes, he is. Would you please stand with me? Our mission at this church is not to outrun the church next door. Number one, my songs are probably ain't the greatest. I do kick my foot up once in a while to let you know I'm alive. But that's not what we're all about. We're all about knowing him. Amen. We're all about experiencing him. We're all about, it, about expressing him. That out of our bellies will flow rivers of living water. I want to know him. I want to walk with him. This old pastor wants to know him deeper. And you know what I'm praying for, Wayne? I'm praying for the fear of God. I'm praying to understand it in its fullness. I'm praying to understand because I know it is the compass that keeps me in the middle of the road and out of the either ditch. It is, it is, it is the fear of God. It's weighty. I want you to the glory of God is weighty. As that man had asked yesterday, well, if he knows all things, why? I'll tell you why. Because he's raising up sons to share with him for eternity. And the Bible said that he that overcometh will I grant to sit with me. And he said, and he will rule with me with a rod of iron. That's the millennial reign of Jesus. We're going to be busy in the millennial reign. It's not going to be a democracy. It's going to be a theocracy. God's total rule during that thousand years. said the lamb and the wolf were laid together. The carnivorous and the whatever the other ones are. I guess they're the eaten ones. will all lay together and there'll be a peace and there'll be harmony. Because I want you to know this right now. If this country lived by the Ten Commandments, we'd already have it. We'd already have it. No murder, no adultery, no putting other gods before the God in heaven. What, a, what an oasis this country would be. But it is coming. And God will be the Lord sitting on the throne of David forever. What a wonderful thing that is. With every head bowed. If you're here today and you're saying, I want to understand this glory. I want to walk in it. I want to, I want that holy reverence. I want that fear in my life because it will open up every other aspect. It will give me joy. It'll give me completeness and it will keep me on the straight and narrow way and not into the ditch of the left or the right. There's someone that wants special prayer. I want to pray with you. If you, if you want special prayer this morning, I want to pray. I, I see that hand. Amen. Yes, I see that hand. That's right. That's right. See, we humble ourselves. It takes humility.
to walk in front of people and to say, hey, I'm on Donna, or if there's something in my life, I'm a Christian, but I want more of him. Is there someone else here today? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Those who raised their hand, would you come? And maybe you haven't raised a hand and you're stinking out. I think I might come anyway. Would you come for prayer? I want to pray with you. called us to, to wield the sword. He's called us to be warriors. He said, you fight not against flesh and blood, but spiritual principalities and powers. Satan wants to destroy us. that wants to hinder him and to keep him from the perfectness of God. Father, Satan would love to shame him and make him feel shame. But God, you called him to walk in your glory. And Lord, we bind every demon spirit. I want you to do this right now for me, brother. I want you to say, I renounce every demon spirit that would come and kill me. Every demon spirit. Every demon spirit. Every demon spirit. That hinders me. That hinders me. And stand in the power and stand in the power in the presence of my Lord. In the presence of my Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. God is good. Uh, all right. You too, sir. If, 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 if you, you know, the thing you gotta realize is we have an enemy of our soul. And he wants to destroy. You know what he does when he can get us out of the Lord? He goes to the Lord and he mocks us. And he said, Look at your servants. How can you be proud of them? How can you know them? And that's what he does. But I want you to know, he cares nothing about you. My addictions care nothing about you. All the other demon spirits that want to absorb you and really take you. In Jesus' name. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for my brother. I pray, Father, that you would strengthen and keep him. In the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Lord, as he commits himself unto you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Just ask the Lord to forgive you. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Receive me again as your son. Allow your Holy Spirit to dwell within me. Father, I ask you to have your will and your way in my life. I strengthen you and I love you. I bind every demon spirit through the authority of Jesus Christ from hindering, possessing, or whatever. That it would be off of me right now in Jesus' name, through the power, and I receive the cleansing of your blood. In Jesus' name. Amen. God is good. You've got to see a whole new life. Brand new. I want you to know that. My brother, I want you to know that I love you too. And, and you know, we're men. And it, there's a fit for, oh my goodness, it's, it's a mess up there. And it's so easy for us to get tarnished. And I'm not exempt. But I've had to come to a place where I say, oh, I need it. I, I need you. I need you. Because I want that glory. I want that. I, I want what it's going to take to deliver my brothers and sisters from the hell they're living in. And words alone, I know they're not. We need the anointing. Even in your singing, brother, and I and I have always felt the Lord. But Lord God, bring the house down. Lord, when I open my mouth, let the Holy Ghost within me. Let that let that that that, that, that heavenly river be let loose. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, that people would not only enjoy the song, but they would be changed. That's what it's all about. For each one of us. And the same with me. I said, Lord, not just a sermon. No matter how many thousands of sermons. But Lord, to hear from you. To hear from you in Jesus' name. I love you, Lord. God bless you. God bless you. Is there any
anyone else here that would like to, to be prayed for, for whatever reason, for any reason, I want you to know. I just want you to know that what I preach today is real. That our eyes be open to see. This is the Word of God. And if it's the Word of God, then it is God. And we've heard from Him today. And He loves each and every one of us. God is good. Amen. Amen. Uh, could we, do, we just close real quick with a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, I thank you for everyone that has come to the sanctuary this morning. I pray for those that are sick and not able to come. I pray, Lord God, that you would have your way in all of our lives. Lord, draw us together. Knit us together in the power. You said one will chase a thousand, two will put ten thousand to flight. And God, we know that there's strength in numbers. And we ask, Lord God, that we would be knit together in love. Lord, as Barbara uh, uh, spoke this morning, that we would lift each other up even to be greater than ourselves. Lord, what a powerful place that is. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you. Wayne, so good to see you. You tell your son. Go ahead. Yeah.